we told you earlier that a secret Vatican document, some 41 years old, has been revealed and that it instructed members of the church from the highest level down to consider allegations of sexual abuse by priests as the strictest secret. While it's still not clear how influential this document really was, some were saying it makes it very difficult for the Vatican to separate itself from the secretive policies of individual archdioceses. Phil Salviano founded the New England chapter of SNAP, the Survivors Network for those abused by priests. In 1992, he went public with allegations that he was abused by a priest. He settled out of court. That priest was later sent to prison for 275 years in subsequent cases. Salviano joins us tonight from Watertown, Massachusetts. Phil, thanks very much for being with us. What do you make of this document? Some are saying it's a smoking gun. Do you think that's true? Well, I think it lays out the, uh, the plan that the Vatican had. It's, it's almost as if it's a textbook that all the bishops were taking their lessons from. Because as, as we've learned in the last 18 months, in diocese after diocese, not only across the United States, but in many other parts of the world, bishops had a plan whereby victims were silenced, pedophile priests were protected, and none of this was, was ever reported to civil authorities or revealed to the general public. But Phil, what I don't understand, if, if this was disseminated to bishops throughout the United States, how come it's remained secret th th this long? doesn't surprise me at all. There's a lot of uh, secrecy within the Vatican. For example, if you look at this document, it's filled with terms like secret archives and perpetual silence and destroying evidence, secret of the Holy Office. Um, I'm just tremendously relieved that finally the document has surfaced and it's being given the attention that it warrants. Uh, let me put up a statement uh, made by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishop, uh, B of Bishops. This is what they said. I'm going to read it out loud. A 40-year-old document of the former Holy Office issued March 16, 1962 is being portrayed by some in and outside the media as a smoking gun, allegedly proving that there was a ground plan for covering up the crime of sexual abuse of minors by clerics. The essential point in response to those making this claim is they are taking the document entirely out of context, therefore distorting it completely. Your thoughts? I don't think it's being taken out of context at all. It talks very clearly about investigating crimes against children, uh, swearing all sides to secrecy. There's one part of this document that talks about the victim being forced to put his hands on the Bible and swear that he would keep this a secret under the threat of excommunication. Do, does, uh, I mean, what they say in response is this does nothing to prevent and, and was not an indication that they wanted people to prevent uh, filing civil charges uh, against uh, the alleged uh, victimizer. Uh, do, you think that is, do you think that's true or do you, or do you think that's simply false? I don't, I don't see the connection, really. Well, the church is saying, you know, that this document doesn't really say anything about uh, pursuing uh, civil, ca civil cases or stopping victims from, from going to authorities. Do you think it does? Well, I think it does because, because the victim is sworn to secrecy. I mean, it, it, it doesn't even, there's not even a provision in here for a victim who might want to need to go to see a therapist, for example. I mean, I think this is a very hostile document uh, in the way it treats victims, in the way it uh, has no sort of... Um, no concern for the victim's emotional health or their need to heal from this experience. Do you think this impacts uh, future lawsuits, lawsuits that are ongoing now? I mean, you know, there have been some suits in which um, some dioceses declare bankruptcy or, or threaten to declare bankruptcy, basically mm -hmm. say we don't, we don't have the money. Uh, there are those who would say, well, if you can link this to the Vatican, obviously uh, there, there's more money there. Do you, is this going to play into that? You know, I'm not a lawyer, Anderson, but I can tell you that from, from my interpretation of this, it does show that the secrecy goes right to the top of the Vatican. And if this is something that the lawyers can use, I, I think it should be tested. And uh, I think many survivors, as well as many faithful Catholics, whose uh, trust in the church has been shattered this past year, will be very eager to see how this all plays out. I'm curious, what, what went through your mind? I mean, this has been such a, I mean, this has obviously transformed your life. It's something you, you, you think about all the time, I'm sure. When, when you heard about this document, what was the first thing that went through your mind? Well, I had heard rumors of this document for several years, and I had often wondered how it was that each bishop in each diocese was pretty much operating the same way in terms of, of moving priests from parish to parish and, and you know, having victims sign confidentiality agreements. The effort was always on secrecy and protecting the priest. And I thought it was very curious that, that each bishop was acting the same way. And now this sort of answers that, because it shows that perhaps there was a, uh, a document or a plan that everybody was, was working from. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating document. It's really still a developing story.